Okay. So hi, everyone. Um, hopefully everyone can see and hear me. Um, thank you so much for um, tuning in to learn about uh, a subject that I think is really um, an important one for animal advocates and for farmed animal advocates in particular. Um, and it is sort of under, um, it's, it's not as well known as maybe some other subjects um, in the animal rights movement or um, in, in these areas. And that is um, the subject of humane washing. Um, so just to introduce myself briefly, uh, my name is Kelsey Eberly. I'm a staff attorney at the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and I do civil litigation. And part of what I um, practice as a, a litigator for animals is these cases that would fall under the, um, the heading or the rubric of humane washing. Um, so the, the, the subhead of my presentation here is how to protect animals through consumer legal advocacy. And um, you know, this presentation is really supposed to answer this question of, you know, why, you know, what do animals get out of us filing lawsuits on behalf of people who eat meat? Um, you know, you might be wondering why we go to all the effort to protect the interests of meat eaters. And hopefully this presentation will answer that and will show the really significant benefits um, that come uh, for animals from filing these kinds of cases. Um, so I'll, I'll leave a few minutes for questions at the end. Um, actually, Hope, I, I can't see the clock right now. So if you wouldn't mind letting me know when it's um, 2.45, that would be awesome. And I'll just... Um, jump into, I'll end and jump into the question. Um, you got it. I'll give you a five minute warning. Awesome. Thanks. So first, um, what is humane washing? So humane washing comes from um, sort of the, the term green washing, if we've heard of that, you know, describing products or services as having environmental benefits that they don't actually have, you know, when something is marketed as sustainable or green or earth friendly, that's green washing. And the term humane washing came about because um, you know companies that and producers that sold animal products, animals, you know, pet stores, um, animal entertainment, you know, wanted to assure their customers that the products or the services or the entertainment was humane or otherwise not harmful to the animals. Um, and in the case of animal products, you know, uh, meat, milk, and eggs, um, you know, this humane washing is really to cover up uh, the horrible cruelty of animal agriculture. And the fact that, you know, people are gaining more awareness of what animals experience in agriculture and getting really uh, disturbed by it and not wanting to, you know, eat the way that they used to. And in response, the industry, the, you know, the industry is sort of um, response to that was not to improve their, you know, their uh, production methods or to, you know, start making vegan food instead of uh, killing animals. It is to try to describe their products as being more humane uh, in order to attract, you know, people who care about that issue. And people do, you know, care about animal welfare. They don't, you know, sort of, um, they don't want to feel like they're supporting animal cruelty or participating in animal cruelty. So this sort of these sorts of representations that make people feel OK about the products they're buying, um, this sort of humane washing has become um, very, very prevalent in um, the animal, animal agriculture um, and those who you know, profit off of it. Um, so it's a big problem because it keeps people um, you know, eating lots of meat and animal products and feeling okay about it um, because it causes animals um, to you know, continue to suffer uh, horribly in, um, in agricultural settings and um, keeps you know, driving up consumer demand for the products of that cruelty by you know, attracting people with this marketing. Um, so hopefully that answers a little bit of the first bullet point. Um, the second would be why lawsuits? You know, why would you choose not to, you know, have a public education campaign about this or try to, you know, change a law to change this? And we definitely, you know, do do those things. Um, but lawsuits are one really kind of tangible and direct way of stopping uh, humane washing. So going right to the source and saying what you're doing is illegal. Um, it's misleading people because this is not the reality of, of the products that, that you're selling. 
Um, and so it allows us to stop the false advertising. Um, it also allows us to use the lawsuits as a vehicle for the those education efforts to try to tell people, you know, everything is not okay with these eggs. And with this, you know, we just logged me in on another computer. Is someone, it, sorry. Is, no PowerPoint access, you know, no access. Hope. All those icons are gone. Hope I'm I'm hearing a can someone can you move yourself? <laughs> I guess. What what link did you use? The one that uh, Hope, the one Hope that or Justin articles on their that list of links. <laughs> Hope. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you for muting yourself. Okay. Um sorry about that. So um I think I'll save the last uh, bullet point, how do animals benefit from consumer actions? Till the end, because um, I hope it will become evident uh, in this presentation, you know, how they do benefit. But if it doesn't, then we'll we'll talk about that at the end. So I'll, I'll just pause and say all of these um, pictures on the slide here are examples of humane washing that um, my organization or uh, others like PETA or Direct Action Everywhere um, have gone after uh, with lawsuits um, to, to try to stop the humane washing. So, like I said just a minute ago, you know, why why is there humane washing? Humane washing is because these perceived welfare attributes of animal products really command a premium. The, you know, people selling animal products know that they can charge more for those products and that they can get more people to buy them if they if the if people perceive them as being more humane, more natural, you know, made with fewer drugs. And I, I sort of add these terms humane and, and natural and pure drugs together because it's not only the explicit claim that an animal product is humane that we consider humane washing. It's also all the other sort of attributes about the way the animals are raised that people are looking for that you know, to them signify um, a higher welfare uh, product. Um, so that would mean, you know, everything about the way the animals, um, you know, might have access to the outdoors or um, the types of antibiotics and growth hormones and drugs that are fed to them, you know, all of the kind of representations about those things, you know, when they are false, we consider those humane washing because they're all sort of, they all funder, fall under this rubric of, you know, making people feel better about the way that the animals are being raised, um, even if, you know, it, it, it's, uh, the reality is not, um, not what's being uh, portrayed. And you know the people's perceptions about animal products come in significant part, you know, from labeling and marketing. And so, in terms of being a source of what people understand about, um, you know, about farm animals, about the products that they're buying, you know, this, you know, labeling representations and marketing is a really important source of that information. And and be, when it lies to consumers, you know, that's when false advertising lawsuits can step in. Um, so, you know, what are they trying to cover up? I think most people um, probably know the cruelties inherent in animal agriculture. Um, and, you know, this evidence has come to us, you know, from, from uh, undercover investigations and, you know, people really selflessly stepping up and um, going inside these horrible facilities and taking these videos and really telling us the truth. And without this truth, um, you know, we often aren't able to file lawsuits that, you know, uncover um, the falsity of the, the labeling claims and the marketing representations, you know, without undercover investigations that have shown, you know, animals suffering in horrible ways, um, you know, the, the animal product sellers can claim that the representations aren't false. So the undercover investigations and what we know about animal agriculture through these investigations is a really important part of these cases. <laughs> Excuse me. So the I'll just go back and or say that the prior slide. <coughs> Excuse me. The piglets in the prior side prior slide was from an investigation that we did of the mash offs, which is the third largest um, pig producer in the United States. And this was their website um, on the right here uh, that was talking about the way the animals were raised. So you know, someone holding a pig, cute little piglets, um, you know, green grass. That's sort of a classic um, image of humane washing. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So what are some of the legal tools that we use to combat false advertising? There are state and federal lawsuits, so lawsuits filed in state court and federal court using state laws and federal laws. We make complaints to um, self-regulatory bodies, which are um, non-governmental bodies that can police advertising. So, <coughs> excuse me, the chief example is the Better Business Bureau's National Advertising Division. Um, and finally, we can make complaints and demands for enforcement to federal agencies that are charged with um, in, ensuring that advertising and marketing is, is truthful. So that would be the Federal Trade Commission, the Food and Drug Administration, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and um, state attorneys general in all 50 states uh, generally have obligations to protect consumers. So we can use a, a wide variety of different laws um, and strategies to try to stop humane washing. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over a cough. So um, one really important kind of um, caveat to all of this work is that it is very, very difficult for people to, to challenge through legal challenges, the labeling on um, meat and poultry products. So, you know, um, products from cows and um, pigs and um, chickens uh, all slaughtered for their meat um, and turkeys. Uh, this is not the case with eggs and um, dairy products, but with um, meat and poultry products, the U.S. Department of Agriculture actually reviews the labels of those products beforehand and pretty much always approves them. And that review and approval process prevents advocates from trying to essentially disagree with the USDA's conclusion that the label is not misleading. So in other words, if the USDA thinks that a company, you know, can, can call its product you know, natural or free range or humane, <clears throat> excuse me, there's very little that um, that advocates can do in terms of lawsuits to try to stop that because of a legal concept called preemption, which basically means that federal law is, um, is uh, uh, supreme over state law. And so you can't file a state um, uh, law challenge to these labels. So that's just one sort of, um, caveat to to this uh, this work. So now I'm going to get into talk talking about a couple of these cases and these cases kind of fall into two what I think of as two groups. Um, one group is when you know the largest sort of indisputably horrible <laughs> for lack of a better word um, you know industrial farming companies, um, basically try to cover up, you know, their um, production methods with a variety of um, euphemisms and falsehoods. And these generally talk about, you know, animal well-being and science-based welfare standards and, um, you know, nutritious feed. Um, they sort of have, you know, one group of, of um, common misrepresentations. Not, they often call products natural. Um, and so that's sort of one camp. And the case, the Hormel case that I'll be talking about in a few minutes is sort of an example of that. Another example, or sort of the second type of this case, I think of as the companies that kind of make humane claims the center of their branding. So, you know, if you buy, um, you know, Hormel chili or, or any other product, you know, the, the center of that marketing is not that the product is humane. But if you go to Whole Foods um, and you walk around the store, you will see quite a lot of uh, representations about how Whole Foods has, you know, the strictest animal welfare standards. They use the Global Animal Partnership. And there's just a lot um, about, you know, how the animals are treated. And they sort of make that the centerpiece. And so, you know, it, and they sort of, um, you know, hold themselves to these standards and purport to, to be following these these higher standards. And so those are sort of two groups of these cases. <coughs> Excuse me. So this case um, was filed several years ago in district court uh, in California, federal court. Um, PETA filed a lawsuit uh, on behalf of several shoppers at Whole Foods and filed it against Whole Foods, basically claiming that Whole Foods uh, animal welfare standards uh, we're, we're just a sham and that the animals raised for these products 
um, were, you know, not treated humanely and did not, um, you know, have sort of cruelty-free lives by any stretch of the imagination. And PETA pointed to investigations and other things about the standards that they say they said were not consistent with, you know, a humane uh, quote unquote product. And, you know, one thing to kind of point out about this is that legally it's not sufficient to say for PETA to say, you know, we don't think these products are humane. The legal standard is that the average consumer, the reasonable consumer would not view this, these representations as true. So PETA had to show that the average consumer, when they saw the, these representations, would think of something that was materially different than the truth. So would would believe that the animals were being treated more humanely than they actually were. That's the, the legal standard. And the reason I'm talking about this case first is because um, this was an example of a case that failed because of that concept of preemption and labeling approval that I was just speaking about. So somewhat amazingly, the court in this case was not sure whether all these signs um, that you can see here constituted meat labels. Um, it sounds sort of absurd, but the this sort of um, the USDA's stranglehold over meat labels has gotten so broad that courts are now unsure whether even representations like the ones you see here might be considered labeling that the USDA has approved and therefore outside of the court's jurisdiction. Um, so that's just an example of, you know, even where the, the legal tools are strong, so California's unfair competition and false advertising laws are very strong tools to combat humane washing. In this case, <coughs> the, the suit did not um, succeed because uh, the, the court found that um, that it, it didn't know whether the USDA had had approved these labels or these representations. Um, another example of the kind of you know company that is trying to make um, its animal raising model uh, the centerpiece of its um, marketing is Diesel Turkey Ranch. And so the ne next case I want to talk about is a case filed by Direct Action Everywhere against Diesel Turkey Ranch in California Superior Court in November of 2017. Um, and so some of Diesel's marketing is uh, here on the right. You see turkeys um, outside in the grass, living, you know, seemingly happy lives, as, as Diesel would um, put it. You know, they talk about the family philosophy and all of the marketing is, you know, made to make people believe that the turkeys are essentially living in paradise and not suffering, you know, in any way. And Direct Action Everywhere had gone inside um, barns at Diesel Turkey Ranch and filmed the conditions. And unsurprisingly, they were not exactly what uh, Diesel was portraying. And uh, Direct Action Everywhere, um, you know, released a report about this. And, and Diesel was also sourcing to Whole Foods, which is, which is why you see the Whole Foods um, here on the slide. But they also filed the lawsuit and they said, you know, we have the right to sue Diesel for misleading consumers. Um, and they used the same laws that were at issue in the, in the Whole Foods case, the California consumer protection laws. And this case um, you know, really went far. It, it actually just went to trial, um, I believe a couple months ago. Um, and I'm not sure whether there's been a decision yet, but, um, you know, this is a really, um, significant case because it's an example of, you know, of DXC really uncovering, you know, just the, the fraud that Diesel Turkey Ranch was, um, and is, and, you know, and telling consumers about it, you know, telling consumers, you, you know, don't believe what you're seeing, don't believe this marketing, that's not the reality, and showing them the reality. Um, so this is an example of how a lawsuit sort of plays a part in that narrative and those consumer education efforts. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk about a, a case that I was referring to earlier. Um, and this is our case, the Animal Legal Defense Fund's case against Hormel Foods over their Natural Choice advertisements. So Natural Choice is a brand of Hormel um, lunch meat and bacon products. 
um, that Hormel uh, began marketing in 2015 as um, the natural choice. And so they used a broad variety of advertising media from you know, YouTube videos, Judy Greer was the star, um, to a new website, to these magazine inserts, to coupon you know, uh, inserts. And all of the advertisements were claiming that Hormel's natural choice products were you know, superior, natural, um, you know, no preservatives, basically something different than, you know, industrially produced meat from tortured animals. And when we saw these, um, we, you know, began to work against them and try to, you know, spread the word about how they were false. And then we finally filed a lawsuit in um, just in um, DC Superior Court in, in the District of Columbia um, in 2016 under the DC Consumer Protection Procedures Act, which is a really strong consumer protection statute that allows a large uh, group of, of um, plaintiffs uh, to sue in order to stop false and misleading advertising. Um, so I'll just play really quickly so you can see uh, one of the ads from Horm the Hormel Natural Choice campaign. We love all that is natural. Let us share our bounty. I picked one acre of raspberry to make this jam. And I made this wine. I got this honey from a beehive in the forest. I gathered these nuts. I just went to the store and bought Hormel Natural Choice lunch meat. It's preservative free. Join us. You know you want one. So, you know, it's tongue in cheek. It's kind of funny. Um, you might think, you know, what is that ad really communicating? It's just sort of a joke. Um, but no, it, it actually has a message. You know, these are people who, even though it's, you know, kind of a jokey thing, they care about where their food is coming from. They're seeking out more natural products. They, you know, um, they're naturalists. Uh, and, um, you know, this lunch meat is sort of portrayed as something that would satisfy that, you know, type of consumer. And so it's, it's a little bit subtle, but not really. Uh, you know, it's meant to communicate that the meat in this, you know, this sandwich is coming from animals raised better than, you know, than the meat that goes into spam, which is the exact same, you know, it's the exact same animals. It's killed in the exact same way, raised in the exact same way. Um, so this was this campaign that we were going after. And another you know, reason that we were focusing on Hormel in this campaign was that we had investigated, you know, I've done an undercover investigation of one of Hormel's um, main suppliers, the Mashoffs, as I mentioned, and just found you know, the most horrible uh, animal suffering. Um, and the, uh, the Hormel, one of the Hormel slaughterhouses had also been investigated um, by compassion over killing and similarly, you know, uncovered just horrendous abuse of pigs. And we knew that this was, you know, completely at odds with this sort of superior natural, you know, um, higher standards um, marketing that Hormel was putting forth. And so we wanted to, you know, to stop that falsity and to expose what was really happening. Um, the lawsuit we lost at the trial court and it's now up in appeal. Um, we lost sort of on technical issues, not on the merits, excuse me. Um, and this is sort of an example of even though, you know, we were unsuccessful, at least in this stage of the litigation, through the litigation, we gained a huge amount of information about Hormel's practices, you know, their, their pig suppliers, their turkey suppliers, their chicken suppliers, their beef suppliers, and all of the ways that the turkeys and chickens and um, pigs and cows made, you know, um, killed for those products suffer and what they're, you know, how they're confined and what they're fed. And, and we um, wanted to tell consumers about that information in order to, you know, counter this advertising campaign. So we basically gave that information, the information that wasn't um, confidential through the lawsuit, we gave that information to uh, reporters and they did stories on this. And so, um, you know, even though the lawsuit hasn't um, succeeded yet, although we're hopeful that um, we'll win the appeal, you know, we are we were able to kind of get the word out about, you know, what 
um, what a fraud uh, this natural choice campaign was and how um, animals raised for Hormel's products are, are really treated. Um, so now we'll move on to another family of cases. Um, and these are cases about dairy. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, briefly three cases, um, two of them that we are litigating, the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and one that um, other attorneys are, are litigating. And all of these um, cases, um, they're cases against Tillamook, Tillamook County Creamery Association, uh, Fair Life, which is the Coca-Cola, um, you know, uh, specialty milk um, in this picture on the right, and Ben and Jerry's. And all of these cases are, are similar in some way, chiefly in these companies sort of representing that the cows that, um, you know, uh, uh, that are milked um, for, to provide the milk for these dairy products, basically live these idyllic lives, you know, um, the pictures on the left here of the little girl feeding the calf and the cows in the in the field, those are part of Tillamook's marketing. Um, Fair Life bottles were promising extraordinary care for our cows. And um, at the bottom here is uh, Ben and Jerry's caring dairy uh, program, which you know um, shows you know, children. Uh, it's really disturbing how many of these advertising campaigns rely on children children, you know, caring for calves and, and providing, you know, the best care. Um, and we knew uh, that um, these campaigns that the Tillamook and the Fair Life representations were false. Um, the Tillamook, uh, let's see, okay, yeah. So they were false for various reasons, um, not all the same. Uh, so I think I'll first start with the Tillamook case. Tillamook, um, for those, maybe some people live in um, Oregon or, or familiar with the Tillamook brand, it's sort of this cult uh, brand. It's, it has this really um, significant following and, um, you know, sort of this really strong Oregon pride. Tillamook County is this county in, um, in on the coast of Oregon that is green with rolling hills, um, all these pastures and these sort of, you know, small, um, idealized, um, you know, uh, family dairies. And those, um, you know, idealized uh, small dairies were the centerpiece of Tillamook's marketing campaign. So all of its representations were showing, you know, across Instagram and its website and YouTube ads were showing um, those farms and showing families and children caring for the cows and basically suggesting that all Tillamook, you know, products came from those kinds of cows and, you know, those kinds of farms where cows are treated like family. Um, and Tillamook's products are, you know, the vast majority are actually, uh, the milk is coming from the largest dairy uh, in the United States. It's a massive industrial dairy in Eastern Oregon where tens of thousands of cows are con confined, um, never have access to pasture, don't you know, live lives anything like what's um, portrayed in Tillamook's marketing campaign. And so we filed a, a lawsuit on behalf of a class of Oregon consumers um, earlier this year, <coughs> excuse me, and that case is now proceeding um, and we're getting into discovery now and hoping to, you know, investigate and substantiate our claims further. Um, so this lawsuit is sort of about, you know, the living environment and treatment of cows. Um, the Fair Life suit, people might be familiar with Fair Life um, from the undercover investigation released by ARM uh, last year, showing horrible abuse and suffering, um, particularly of calves. So you can see a, a picture of an, a person kicking a calf. And as soon as that investigation was released, a large number of, um, you know, large uh, plaintiff uh, class action firms, you know, not animal rights groups, um, filed lawsuits on behalf of consumers, um, really showing that these kind of suits, you know, are are kind of going even beyond um, the animal protection movement and groups like us who, who have traditionally filed them, but are being filed by, you know, even other law firms. So one of those was, um, one of the consumer class actions was Michael versus Fairlife filed in the Northern District of Illinois, um, which we joined um, and are now litigating uh, with with a with the firm that filed it. Um, 
and you know we we want to bring this case and we are bringing the case sort of beyond the horrible abuse that was captured in the video which is of course you know inconsistent with a company that represents extraordinary care for their cows but also to show that you know even when they're not kicking cows the way that Fairlife treats the cows you know uses them in in dairy production is not extraordinary care and is not you know humane as as the company was representing um and so that case is is also now you know proceeding and, and hopefully we'll be into discovery soon and finally um this is now a lawsuit we were a part of but um ben and jerry's uh you know beloved vermont brand i live in vermont um was sued in on a similar theory to the tillamook case basically saying that you know they portray all the cows as living these you know idealized lives on pasture when they source from you know large industrialized uh, facilities that treat cows inhumanely and that don't give them the kind of care that's represented and Ben and Jerry's marketing. And actually, we just discovered um, that Ben and Jerry's uh, is removing um, the happy cow claim on their products as a result of this lawsuit. So that's um, you know a positive development. And so finally, I want to talk about a couple of cases involving eggs. You know, I think many of us know that um, hens raised to produce eggs uh, suffer really un almost unimaginably. Um, particularly those raised in these large indoor facilities and those raised in cages. Um, and so I would say that egg marketing is actually some of the most pervasively deceptive. You know, the type of representations that, um, that are shown here, you know, are pretty common. And so we wanted to go after that. And we, um, one of the ways that we did that was by uh, filing a lawsuit against Trader Joe's over the cartons at issue uh, below. And um, remember from the earlier slide that we're actually able to go after these packages because unlike with meat and poultry, other poultry products, eggs, um, the labels are not, you know, reviewed and approved by the US Department of Agriculture. So, you know, we have the ability to bring state false advertising lawsuits to, to try to combat the falsity here. So, we represented a Northern California egg purchaser and um, filed a suit just seeking um, what's called injunctive relief. So that means basically for them to stop this packaging. We weren't seeking damages. We just wanted them to stop the packaging. Um, and we knew that Trader Joe, the eggs, the uh, hens that were producing the eggs in that were going into these packages, you know, lived a life nothing like uh, what is portrayed here. These are the facilities that the those hens actually lived in. Um, you know, not a blade of grass in sight. The hens never see the light of day. Um, and someone satirized this carton uh, below on the right or on the left here, um, which is a you know really accurate person in a hazmat suit with a barn in the background. You know, that's the real the reality of these cage free eggs. And you know, we wanted to go after cage free because we saw that companies were using this sort of as a synonym for cruelty free and you know maybe cage free has improvements over battery cages but it's certainly not cruelty free and it's certainly not anything like what was pictured on um on the package uh the packages that i just showed so trader joe's as soon as we filed this lawsuit trader joe's came to the table and we resolved the case almost immediately and that resulted in them removing the cartons from store shelves nationwide so they are no longer representing um, their cage-free eggs as coming from those idyllic facilities. And finally, a similar case to the, the Trader Joe's case is PETA's, PETA's recent case against Nellie's eggs. And maybe some people are familiar with this um, with these advertisements because they have done a lot of television advertisements, um, basically saying, you know, that the hens, um, you know, kept for Nellie's eggs are you know treated with the utmost respect and care um you know this is an example of a company that really represents you know makes the animal treatment at the center plate centerpiece of their marketing as you can see from these cartons and PETA had done an undercover investigation and again not surprisingly found it was nothing like what was being represented that the hens were suffering horribly 
were crowded indoors, um, were you know subjected to cruelty. And um, as a result, PETA filed this lawsuit in uh, the Southern D District of New York um, and you know wanted to expose the lie that Nellie's was telling. Um, and I'll just say this is somewhat similar to a suit that we filed um, against a producer called Handsome Brook a Farm, and they sell only um, pasture raised eggs, which um, you know people who seek out you know supposedly more ethically produced eggs, you know the sort of gold standard is said to be pasture raised eggs. Um, but in the case of Handsome Brook Farm, you know we discovered that that was not the case, and that the hens raised for the pasture raised eggs were a not being pasture raised and b you know suffering in the same way as 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 other hens um, raised for other types of eggs and so we filed a similar lawsuit and that lawsuit resulted in Hanson Brook agreeing to a period of um, monitoring essentially where we could um, you know look at um, their their um, auditing and and basically see that they were uh, adhering to certain standards which you know, is one sort of potential benefit of these sorts of suits is that the relief might not only be packaging changes, it could be, you know, um, uh, relief that's about the way the animals are treated um, directly. And finally, I want to mention, um, I, I was mentioning it earlier, that it's not only lawsuits that are important to stop humane washing. Um, there's also a lot of regulatory advocacy that we engage in and that um, any member of the public can 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 uh, participate in. And this is basically trying to get the federal agencies that have jurisdiction over this problem to do a better job to stop humane washing. Um, and so this has taken the form of comments on you know, proposed rules from the federal agencies, petitions for rulemaking to the agencies, um, we have filed a number of petitions calling for mandatory labeling of certain attributes. So, for example, whether hens are kept in cages, because um, we really feel that, you know, there's so much deception in the marketplace that, you know, at the bare minimum, people need to have basic information about the way that animals are raised. And the, the most important place to put that would be on the label. So we've called for those kinds of um, those kinds of changes and additions. So far, unsuccessfully, uh, unfortunately, the agencies don't are uh, unsurprisingly not eager to make these changes. Um, and I did want to mention one um, uh, uh, opportunity that is actually available right now for anyone who wants to participate. The USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service, which is the division of USDA that reviews and approves labels, just came out with its new um, guideline about animal raising claims. And they're calling for public comment about what companies should do in order to call products free range. And so, you know, if people have feelings about, um, about um, you know, the USDA's administration of its labeling um, power, uh, uh, regulatory power, or um, want to say something about free range and, and how it can be deceptive, um, now is the time and you can actually go on to um, regulations.gov and search for um, labeling guideline animal raising claims and find this and, and make a public comment. And we'll be doing that as well. Um, so this is a way that, you know, anyone can really participate. And um, we also can participate, you know, through lawsuits against these agencies if they take actions that are unlawful and that don't um, cure consumer deception. Uh, hey, Kelsey, just to jump in real quick, you got about five minutes left. Okay. <clears throat> Good. Um, so this is my last slide, so that's good timing. Um, so hopefully you've seen a little bit, you know, how animals benefit from false advertising suits. Um, you know, we do these suits very deliberately as public education tools. You know, the point is not just to represent consumers and to file the suit. Of course, that's an important, you know, the, the main point of the lawsuit. But another significant point is to tell people about it, to tell people the reality of what the animals are suffering uh, to produce these products, to educate people not to trust labeling and marketing representations, you know, to um, to just know more about the reality of animal farming, um, and not to sort of buy what's on the label. Um, and we think that doing so, you know, helps re reveal the humane myth that these representations just really can't be trusted. Um, we also file these suits to try to, you know, reduce consumer demand for 
uh, cruel animal products, you know, made from animals who suffer. Um, you know, the marketing is what drives up demand. Um, and so taking away the marketing, you know, um, logically would, would reduce demand. And so that's, you know, an important benefit. Um, and finally, just to get more information, as I mentioned with the Hormel case, you know, we were able to, through the discovery process and litigation, get a lot of information about how the animals are being treated. And, you know, getting that information, as we all know, can be so difficult. And so, you know, lawsuits are one way that we can help hold this industry accountable for the horrible cruelty that they uh, perpetrate on animals. Um, so hopefully uh, that makes sense to everyone. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that um, anyone has. Um, Hope or Justin, if you want to shoot them over to me. Thanks so much, Kelsey. Um, yeah, we're looking to see if there's any comments in the chat. Um, Let's see. Yeah, it looks like lots of great talks. <laughs> I don't know if you can see the chat. I can. All I can see is the PowerPoint. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so somebody just asked that there was going to be a recording of this to watch. And yeah, so you're, we will have um, videos up for everybody to, to watch and to share. Um, and uh, Kelsey, just let you know, also, we're, uh, we break them up into individual videos. So your speaker uh, presentation will be um, its own video that we can, that you can share around if you like. Great, great. Um, yeah, if there's any questions, I'll, um, I guess, just to sort of give you one more piece of useful uh, information, if you're not a lawyer and aren't filing these cases, if you are a lawyer, you should be filing these cases. Um, but if you're not a lawyer, you know, just kind of calling out um, these false representations, knowing more about how companies are marketing the products and um, being able to talk about why that's, you know, false. Um, telling us about, you know, telling groups that file these sorts of suits about examples of humane washing that you see that might, you know, lead us to file a case. You know, those are all ways. And then, of course, commenting, you know, filing comments um, to um, to federal agencies. You know, those are all ways that you can try to combat humane washing, um, even if you're not, you know, a, a, a lawyer filing, filing lawsuits. Awesome. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, let's see. Um, Kelsey, somebody did ask, will AD ALDF have information on the USDA labeling comment opportunity on your Facebook page or website? I'm not sure we do right now, but I think we're going to do um, an action alert for our members um, and our supporters. So if the person is a member or supporter, um, but I think we'll have a link to that somewhere on our website. So um, hopefully we will. Um, but I'm also uh, glad to, to shoot over a, a link if, um, if you want to post it in the comments after, after I get off, I can shoot over a link to the page that I was mentioning where you can leave a comment to the to Okay. The Great. And um, well, real quick, if you can answer in like 30 seconds, if somebody had um, wanted to send like a lawsuit potential or an issue to ALDF, do you know how they would do that? Yeah, so we have a, um, I, there's a page on our website, but you can also just send it to info, I-N-F-O, at ALDF.org. Um, mm -hmm. That's just our general mailbox, and um, and we uh, will take a look. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks, Kelsey. Okay, thank you so much. All right, bye-bye.